All right, everyone, excited about this conversation. We're going to be talking about capital gains tax brackets today. And, you know, I was helping this individual with their, kind of get their FI plan together the other day. And in fact, we're going to be doing some FI case studies in the near future. And a lot of, you know, a question that comes up is, well, actually, I don't even know how to invest outside of my 401k, which we've talked through that. We'll talk through it. We'll talk through it again in the future. But if you realize that like that conversation hasn't been had yet, then it becomes very obvious that this individual would not understand how capital gains works, right? How capital gains tax brackets work. And so as kind of one of these building blocks of FI, it's really important to understand where these financial tools that are out there fit. Because once you understand the tools and the rules, you can know how to mold them, mold your financial picture around how you want to optimize in the near, mid, and long-term future. So Brad, what do you think? Capital gains tax brackets. Yeah, no, it sounds great. I think it's a really fundamental piece of understanding taxation. And I think it's an important part of being on the journey to FI. So yeah, let's do it. So I think before we talk about capital gains, it's going to be important to just be able to partition these vehicles out. So before we talk about, you know, your taxable investments, we'll get there. Let's talk about tax advantaged and, and what that means practically for someone on the path to financial independence. The two ones that you see most commonly are tax deferred. So I'm not going to pay taxes on this now. And this would be in the context of maybe your employer's retirement plan. You might see a 401k, 403b, 457, and HSA to some degree would fit in this category as well. And then there is the Roth, which also has a couple variants, whether or not you're talking about inside a 401k, you're talking about a Roth IRA. Uh, with the Roth, it's kind of unique in that you're accepting the tax at your income bracket that you're at at that moment in time. And then the growth is tax-free. And when you pull it out, it's tax-free. It's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting vehicle. So those two we've talked about before, and we'll have additional conversations around, but this third category is really what we're going to be spending time on today. And that is what we call your taxable accounts, just your savings that happen to be invested in the market. Yeah. And that word taxable, I think that throws people off. We haven't come up with a, uh, a better way to describe this, but it's generally known as these are your taxable accounts. But like Jonathan said, they're just your savings accounts, right? These are not retirement accounts. They're not tax advantaged, tax deferred. They're none of this. It's just your regular savings. So this is money that you could put in your regular bank account, a savings account, checking account, under your mattress in a freezer, or most likely, hopefully, if you're listening to the show, in some type of ETF or mutual fund that's an index fund, broad-based, low expense ratio fund. That's what we're talking about when we're referring to these taxable investments. These are not a part of any retirement vehicle. That's really the essence of it. I think it's really important when you're having these, these financial conversations to kind of not try to cover everything at once but to focus on one concept, one idea. Because at some point you do view these as tools in your toolbox to use when you need them as it advantages you with regards to the tax code. So what I thought we could do is first we'll definition of terms, you know, what are capital gains? So and we'll get back to that. And then how advantage, how, how even though we call it a taxable account, how there's actually a lot of opportunity here for someone that understands the rules. So I guess, first of all, we just described taxable accounts, capital gains, are, are related to taxable accounts. This is, this is directly related to having money inside of a taxable account. Brad, what is capital gains? Yeah, so a capital gain is essentially the rise in value over your purchase price. So until, and let's just talk about stocks or mutual funds. So let's say you purchased a mutual fund for $100 per share. That's your basis, all right? That's the amount that you bought it for. Now, we're going to exclude some extraneous detail like dividends and things mm -hmm. like that because that gets a little too complicated. But just for the sake of illustration here, the basis in this share is $100. And let's say at some point in the future, it's worth $180. All right. So the current fair market value is $180. Your basis or what you purchase it for is $100. So that difference, that $80 difference of the increase in value is your capital gain. Now, in this case, it is until the point you sell that mutual fund, this is an unrealized capital gain because you have not sold it. You have not realized the capital gain. Now, obviously, when we're talking about tax brackets, that's based on a taxable event. All right. So in this case, you would have to realize or sell the mutual fund shares in order for there to be a taxable capital gain. 
And, and that's interesting. So when we talk about the word realize, really, we could just say sell, right? When do you sell these? And and the question is, are you going to, did you buy it? It, it? it blew up in price and you sold it right away? Or have you been sitting on these funds for a long period of time? And, and, and actually, uniquely to our tax code, these are aptly named as short-term capital gains rates and long-term capital gains rates. And the difference being, did you hold this fund, this tiny little piece of this company or this mutual fund that you have, did you hold it for longer than a year or less than a year? If it's less than a year from the time you bought it, it's now considered short-term capital gains. If you've been holding this for years, right, then now you're talking about long-term capital gains. And there's a difference from the tax treatment. Yeah. So this is a really important concept here. So short-term capital gains. Now, I'm not sure the intention of this this ruling or legislation, but I would like to believe that this is to promote long-term thinking, which really ties into what we talk about here in the FI community. You don't want to be buying and selling things, right? It's, it's bad in terms of behavioral economics. You get your brain and your emotions involved in things. So I think long-term, I think 30 to 50 years. And now the cool thing here is that the tax code follows that thinking. So if you're someone who is selling short-term, as Jonathan just said, under a year, so you've held that security for under a year, the capital gain on that is taxed at your ordinary income rates, okay? So now there's no advantage, no tax advantage to selling this capital gain if it is short-term. It's just at your top marginal tax bracket, which can be certainly in the 20% range or even higher if you make a significant amount of income. So those rates can be significant, but it's the crucial piece here is understanding if it's short-term, it's taxed at your ordinary income rate. Now, if it is long-term, that's where we start getting into some real interesting things here and where Jonathan's going with this case study entirely. You can see the smile <laughs> spreading across my face. Yeah. <laughs> hear it in his voice. And if, if you have sold this security when you've held for at least a year or more, it could be many years or decades, but certainly once it gets to that threshold of a year, it is considered a long-term capital gain. And that's where we start talking. There are very specific capital gains tax brackets. All right. So yeah, the entire, to be honest with you, the entire reason that we are, we are doing this is to talk really about those long-term capital gains rates and the favorable tax treatment. This is going to, we're going to dive into some meat today. So first of all, if you, uh, if you want to follow along with us, Google choose FI and capital gains tax brackets, or you can just go to the show notes for this episode and we'll actually have a link to the article as well. If you're already at the article, congratulations. Let's learn how this works. So when we're talking about long-term capital gains tax rates, it is significantly advantaged if you're living a middle-class lifestyle. And what I mean by that is there's two main brackets that the vast majority of people will follow in for long-term capital gains tax rates. It's either 0%, yeah, you heard me, 0% tax rate if you're making, and I'm going to use these numbers at a for, for a married couple filing joint but we'll actually do a case study for single individuals as well. But married filing joint, up to $80,000 a year, like if you make less than that, you can realize or sell capital gains that meet up to that point, you pay a 0% federal tax on this. And that does not include the standard deduction. So with the standard deduction in mind, you will actually see that swell to just under $105,000. We're going to do a case study on this, but I just mean practically, if you have all of your ducks in a row and you, you're blending your ordinary income, pulling from your 401k and your understanding of how to leverage and sell and keep yourself under these tax thresholds, you could make more, you know, $105,000 or more, you know, and pay $0 in federal tax. And the second bracket, and again, we're talking about this being advantaged, right? Because as compared to your regular ordinary income rates, which can be easily in the 20 plus percents, we're actually talking the second bracket here for long-term capital gains are 15%. Now, Jonathan, you mentioned $80,000 as the taxable income threshold for the 0%. Now, this naturally starts at the next dollar. So $80,001 all the way up to $496,600. So I think it's safe to say 99 plus percent of people listening to this are going to fall in one of those two brackets. So it's either zero 
in the best case scenario, or 15%, which is still phenomenal and is going to be almost invariably lower than your marginal tax bracket for ordinary income rates. So you see why there is an advantage to selling this once it gets to that year or more. Yeah, man. Oh man. For those few of you that don't quite fall under that 400 plus thousand dollars a year uh, bracket, shame. Sorry, shame. <laughs> All right. So when you have someone that is in these higher marginal tax brackets, 22%, 24% in a bond and beyond, we want to do whatever we can while we're bringing in W-2 income to avoid those higher marginal tax brackets and delay it for a day in which we're not subject to those brackets and we can actually deal with capital gains. That's why we're always talking about maxing out our 401k. When we draw that 401k money, now that's going to be treated like ordinary income. But we get to pick how much we want to draw from our 401k and how much we want to draw from our taxable to maximize the advantage that we get with regards to these brackets. The case study that I've set in mind is really catered towards this optimization strategy. Uh, but I think it's important to say like this, this conversation that we're having is then predicated on prior conversations that we've had. And we'll probably have again, talking about just basically understanding the marginal tax brackets at the, as they exist and how you can manipulate. And I say that in a very positive way, it just means knowing the rules, how you can manipulate which one you fall into. So if you're in a 22%, could you put money into your 401k to drop you out of that and keep most of the money that you're bringing home in those lower marginal tax brackets? It's that sort of mentality with this long-term thinking in mind that allows you to be at the point at some point in time where you're talking about up to $100,000 in income, no federal income tax. All right, so I've done two case studies here. Now, if, you, if I think about it in the past, a lot of what we have done has been catered towards this hypothetical, quote unquote, early retiree that's living this extremely frugal lifestyle and is staying in very low, you know, what you would think of as marginal tax. Like that's just, if I were to look back at some of the case studies that's done, it's been really catered towards how can I access my money ahead of time? And it's, it's valuable. All those tools still work here, but it's not going to be our focus today. We're not going to worry about trying to get our money out early. We're not trying to worry about Roth conversion ladders. This is just retirement planning, but understanding the rules ahead of time so you can optimize around it. So for the case study that I picked out, I get to pick the numbers that I want to pick. <laughs> I can make anything. You can have more than this, but there's, you know, these numbers, if you had at least this, you're kind of maximizing your capabilities here. So here's what I came up with. To, so I didn't have to worry about how to get around the, the early, you know, so I didn't have to get around 59 and a half, that kind of, you know, arbitrary age range that our government has come up with. We're just picking a 60 year old couple. So they married, filing joint. They've maxed out a 401k for 20 years. In that 401k, this couple has $850,000, $850,000, 60 years old, $850,000 in the 401k. They also have been dutifully investing in taxable accounts, which we will define as low-cost broad-based index fund of your provider of choice, but not inside of a, uh, a 401k vehicle or a Roth IRA, et cetera. And they actually have $2.5 million, $2.5 million in these taxable accounts. Now, this is a conservative couple. They've been listening to Big Earn. They're, they want to use a 4% rule of thumb, which for them looks like a 3.5% safe withdrawal rate. They just kind of multiplied that out, right? And they came up with a number. Their starting number is $117,000, 200, it could just be 117,000. We, 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 you know, 250 is exact, 117,000, $250 is exactly their total nest egg times 3.5%, but you know, $117,000. So from here, we're going to map out how they can basically have that level of income and pay no federal tax by understanding how this, how to blend their ordinary income from what they have in their 401k and their capital gains from their, from their taxable accounts, how to blend those together to pay nothing, nothing in federal tax. All right, Jonathan. So just to be clear here, we're talking about safe withdrawal rates. So naturally you're going to pull that out, I guess, if that's the money you need to live on, right? So I guess in this hypothetical, this is a pretty high spending couple, right? We're talking about $117,000 a year that they are looking to get, right? Is that fair to say at the outset of this? Yeah, my thought was like, I feel like a lot of people feel like financial independence is for extremely quote unquote, like frugal people. No, it's just math. Like you can scale it. Like there's no, you you do you, right? If this person, if, if, if someone has, you know, expensive lifestyle, there's still a way to optimize, right? So we've done a couple at kind of lower brackets. Like what would it look like to optimize at a higher income, a higher expense level? So 117 is the number I arbitrarily came up with based on their net worth. Gotcha. All right. So to everybody out there, if this number sounds crazy to you, both that 
expense amount uh, or even the $3.35 million that these people have, the concepts are the same. That's the important part here. We're trying to get you to understand how these capital gains tax brackets work. And also there's a real interplay here between the basis and the amount you're allowed to take out and the taxable effects of this. So this is going to be really, really cool, even if you can't relate to this 60-year-old couple with three plus million dollars. So let's let's go back. You remember just saying, let's talk about that free money just for a second here. So we've actually talked about child tax credits in the past. Like let's assume, you know, a 60 year old couple, their kids are out of the nest, right? There's there's no child tax credits coming here. So we're just interested in the standard deduction as it is right now, which for a couple that's married filing joint, we got $24,800. This is how much money, how much income you can bring home without paying anything in federal tax. It's pretty generous. All right. So Jonathan, we're actually saying here, since we talked a couple of minutes ago about the long-term capital gains tax rate of 0%, if your income is under 80,000, that now that's taxable income. So that's 80,000 plus the standard deduction, right? So it's actually $104,800 is the capital gains, the long-term capital gains that you could have showing on your tax return. And you would still pay $0 in federal tax. Is that fair? Yeah, but because the standard deduction is smaller than of those two, of those two options, we're going to start with how to maximize that first. And so I would say you're going to you're going to start drawing money in terms of filling this bucket. If you think about this bucket that we're filling up, we're draw and just in our mental planning, how you actually do this may look different, but for your mental planning, we're going to draw that first $24,800. We're going to draw that out of our 401k cuz this couple has some money. If you remember, they have about 850k in their 401ks and they have like 2 and a half million in taxable accounts. It's a pretty big nest egg, but they're going to take that first $24,800. They're taking that from their 401k. And even though they didn't pay taxes on it, when it went in, even though it grew tax-free, now they're taking it out and they're saying, federal government, you can tax me. But the federal government's like, well, you're in a you know 0% marginal tax bracket, so now you're fine. You're good. So now they haven't paid anything on the growth on that first $24,800. Okay, gotcha. So, right, every dollar that you pull out of a traditional 401k or traditional IRA, that is a taxable event. So you're saying this couple is pulling out $24,800 now that will go onto their tax return as taxable income, but because of the standard deduction, it would wipe that down to zero. So their taxable income is zero. And because of these long-term cap gains tax brackets, they have $80,000 in space yes. in this hypothetical. Yes. So they still have $80,000 uh, in capital gain space. And that's interesting. I'm glad you pointed that out because there's actually a difference between your basis, as you were pointing out at the beginning of this, and your capital gains, right? I mean, so you know, I would if you if you look at a stock that's been a, that's been growing, total returns have looked like eight percent over twenty or thirty years. You would expect that that stock has doubled in price a couple times. Like it might be, you might have, you know, it might be one to four or more. One being your basis and four being kind of the capital gains that have happened over time. That's pretty incredible, and it actually means. Um, it's kind of it's kind of important to think to think through that because you're not being taxed on all of it. You're not you already taxed the first time on what you put in. Okay, so yeah, that is a perfect explanation. So let's just set the stage here. This couple needs one hundred seventeen thousand two hundred and fifty dollars to cover their yearly expenses. We've said that they are pulling out twenty four thousand eight hundred dollars from their four hundred one k. All right, so the remaining amount that they need to cover their lifestyle is $92,450. Now, they need to pull that amount out of their taxable investments. Yes. So that is the amount that they need to live. So mechanically, what happens there is they sell $92,450 worth of stocks or ETFs or mutual funds. And the 92,450 shows up in their bank account and that's the amount that they live on for the year. Okay. Plus the 24,800 that they pulled from their 401k. But now the crucial, crucial point here is that like Jonathan said, not all of that 92,450 is taxable income. It's not all capital gains. Only a tiny portion of it is because it depends on your basis. And of course, there's no way that we can give 
every single example because it depends on the stock or mutual fund or ETF that that you own and is underlying in here. But Jonathan, you just said four to one. So if you're assuming 20% is the basis of this, right? So 92,450 is the cash that you walked away with. But when you actually bought those securities a long, long time ago, the purchase price was actually only $18,490. Right. All right. So that's what's so interesting about the growth of this. And the difference there, you just subtract those out. So 18490 minus 92450 which is what we collected in cash from the sale, the $73,960 is what the actual capital gain is here. Okay, that difference from the basis, what you originally bought it for and what you sold it for, that appreciation, that is the capital gain. And because this is all long-term, it's we've been help, holding it for more than a year, this is long-term capital gain. And now, Jonathan, that fits under the $80,000 that we talked about at the 0% long-term cap gains rate. What you just described should... Like if an audience did not know the rules, their mind should be blown by that. You understand? Like if you hadn't, if that has not been explained to you, this, te- this is basically telling you, this is a replicable process to bring home hundred plus thousand dollars of income and pay nothing, nothing in federal income tax. This is, you don't need to be extremely frugal to pull this off. The vast majority of the people that I know, if they could cr- put steps in place to be in this position at the age of 60 would save themselves tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in tax by understanding the implications of this small little segment that we just recorded now. Wow. Wow. That's powerful. And to your point, we didn't even max out the tax brackets. Like we, we you could have gone farther. We just kind of arbitrarily said, well, three and a half percent safe withdrawal rate. Let's work our way down and kind of go down that way. You could have worked it the other way and say, well, how can I squeeze every single penny out of the long-term capital gains tax brackets. And in fact, even if I don't need it, is there an incentive for me to do so? And I think the case that we could make, and it's a slightly different conversation, maybe we save it for another day, is that, yeah, you probably should and could, and there's a name for that. 